In this video, we'll look at soccer systems and begin with Valerie Lobanovsky's perspective. First, the game is comprised of a system of 22 elements, the players. This system can be divided into two subsystems of 11 elements each, the teams. Each subsystem can be divided again, here horizontally and here vertically. These subsystems can overlap to create other subsystems. In this guided discovery model, the smallest system will contain two elements in interaction. They can be a player and the ball, teammates, or two opponents. The maximum number of elements is 24. The 22 players plus the ball and a coach. Movement between systems is not limited to reduction, moving from a larger to a smaller number of elements. Subsystems can increase in number or combine to become macro systems. Now we'll turn our attention to the act of interacting. These elements do not function in isolation. While the ball and coach are neutral, all of the players are constantly establishing, updating, entering, or leaving one system for another. These systems are based on communication, understanding, agreement, and proximity. This implies that, while systems contain elements, they are defined by functional, that is, goal-centered, relationships. In turn, these relationships are framed by the local constraints in Part 1, why goals are scored, each individual's orientation, their point of view, and the natural motion in the game. Players and the ball move. This alters everyone's point of view about their role in the next potential goal scoring situation. To further complicate this picture, each player will see themselves as part of a system. That's their orientation. But their system may be part of someone else's larger system. The former is a subsystem of the latter. Blindside runs are an example of this situation. Most players can only deal with three, four, or maybe five elements at a time. This is because of the constraints on attention. Only the top players are capable of larger numbers over long periods. Since motion and change of meaning is constant, players must deal with uncertainty. The future position, speed, meaning, and relationship of and between each element is unknown. This creates the instability between elements that necessitates the transitory nature of systems. In order to cope with this uncertainty, players need to continually adjust their relationships within the game. In other words, they will be in a constant state of system destruction and creation. Left alone, this never-ending state results in disjointed exploration, education by consensus. But in a time-constrained, competitive environment, such a path does little to ensure survival. The presence of an end-state macro-system is necessary for such a focus. This end state is represented by the 24th element, the coach. In part one, we looked at the tension between education and training, the end state of activities. Now we'll look at the pathways to achieve those end states and the tension that exists between them. In the broadest sense, end states are determined and achieved through a balance between emergent, bottom-up, and intentional, top-down behavior. These are the basic forms for goal selection and resource allocation. With the coach standing outside the fray, he or she is in a position to view the players, ball, and their interactions. This detached position helps to frame the game's largest macro system. By interacting indirectly with the players, primarily by adjusting the local constraints, the coach is able to interject his or her intent into the emergent flow of the player's behavior because, as Barry Holshoff observes, there must be someone who makes decisions, 
the team can't do it on its own. 